So I'm Amanda, I'm from the Design Council, and um, for anyone who doesn't know anything about the Design Council at all, we're kind of an enterprising charity that puts design at the heart of uh, creating value for society. So that's stimulating innovation, that's supporting public sector, that's looking at our environments, both built environment, housing, um, in every sector and how design plays a role. So design thinking and design sensibility and designers play a role in supporting that. Um, we run a variety of different programmes, public services by design being one of them, which is where we actually have design support for um, public sectors to understand how they can rethink things. A lot of you know, design is really about understanding the consumer, putting the consumer at the heart of things. Um, and I want to talk specifically about the programme that I've been running because I, I work in a department called uh, Challenges where we partner with uh, a client such as in this case the Department of Health and look at how we can use design thinking to try and solve their issue. Um, and in this instance, I mean, we have two specific projects that have been around ageing and dementia over the past couple of years, one with uh, the Department of Health and one with the Technology Strategy Board and they've both been about, okay, you know, how can designers and innovators... Um, entrepreneurs, people come together to uh, solve an issue in a different way. And a lot of the time, especially in the ageing space and especially in dementia, um, it's been public sector that's been paying for things and therefore it's not been looking at what people might want, what they might want in their homes, what, what they might want to engage with. Um, and I've been running a programme called Living Well with Dementia, which has been uh, supporting the development of five new products and services which we launched in April and are now continuing development and Matthew from Groupal sitting over there who mentioned earlier so he'll know far more about his project than I could ever say um, but um, for us a big thing was when we started working with the Department of Health we know that they have strategic aims to improve diagnosis rates um, we've got the first Prime Minister who has uh, made a big point about looking at how we can support people with dementia, how we can increase research into looking for a cure. Um, he's very keen in looking at dementia-friendly communities, whatever they may be, and trying to define them at the moment. Um, but really, if you're going to increase diagnosis rates, then what? Then what happens to people? Um, and a lot of the time at the moment, it's, OK, have a look at the Alzheimer's Society website. So we worked with the Department of Health to say, well, if the issue is about once you're diagnosed, not trying to say to people, it's the end of life. What's the quality aspect? How do you live well with a diagnosis as anything else? And a lot of people will talk about dementia as you know, one of the biggest issues of our ageing time. People living longer, more people ending up with dementia. If you flick to the... Oh, thank you very much. I should know that, shouldn't I? Um, so some of the bigger facts about it. We've got 800,000 people living with dementia in the UK at the moment, and that's just the people who are diagnosed. Um, we're expecting a, a rapid increase in diagnosis rates for a variety of reasons. One, of the ageing population. Two, is also that at the moment um, GPs don't tend to diagnose. And a big part of that is that GPs themselves don't understand that there might be anything that can be done to help people once they've been diagnosed. Um, there's so much stigma attached to it that that's a, another whole programme which we haven't gone into yet. Um, but the big, a big problem is actually you know, changing people's mindsets as to what happens. Um, but also understanding that once somebody knows they have a diagnosis, it's not just about the individual, it's about the, the, the family, the support system that is around them, and, and how you can help that. I mean, one of the biggest issues here is it, annual cost at the moment to the UK is £23 billion a year. Uh, that's pretty amazing. And we run programmes where we have um, uh, expert advisors who work with us and one of them said, you know, at this amount, if you're not making money out of this, you're not trying hard enough. As horrible as that sounds, actually, it's because there's not much out there to help people. And because we've ex expected so much to be around the public sector, we haven't actually looked for the things that are going to help the consumer and the user. And one of the big parts of that is also the consumer, the, the purchaser and the user aren't necessarily the same thing, and David mentioned it. Um, and a big part is who are you selling to, who's going to end up using it, you haven't really had to sell anything if it's just what the public sector are providing. But now we know that the government isn't going to be able to afford to support people throughout all of this. Um, and there's going to be an expectation on people being able to pay for their own care, their own support. What does that mean? And at what point does care start? Um, 
one of the things we used quite a lot was this whole idea you know, one in three people over 65 will develop some form of dementia before they die. And that's already now. That's not in the future. So it's quite a, a large amount. And when we started running this program, what we found was there are an amazing number of people who tell you, well, you know, my grandmother, my mother-in-law, everybody knows somebody in some way, someone they've worked with, someone they're related to. Uh, but yet, actually, the biggest problem is that we still don't really talk about it. We don't really engage with it. We don't... Um, understand it outside of our own space. So we don't put that in, into context. So one of the things for us when we ran this program was actually, how do we get people to think about quality of life? And what does quality of life mean? And what are the things that could help? So we kind of themed the, the question that, we, that went out under kind of three areas. And one was, how do you help people continue doing what they do anyway in their day-to-day -day life? How do you continue, how, how do you help people maintain routine, support what they already want to do? How do you help people prepare and plan for the future? Uh, it's something that's come up, it's something that we do now. now. What are we doing at the moment that helps plan our lives? We're not necessarily thinking about when we retire, but we're always looking to the future in some way. Um, but also, how do you increase kind of, joy and engagement in life and quality of life in the kind of fun that you might have? So we um, ran we an open innovation competition where we put uh, call-outs to anybody who wanted to uh, submit an idea that they actually wanted to make happen. So we looked at how designers fit in a mix of a variety of people, whether it's technology, it's researchers, uh, experts in a variety of things, um, who could design things but also implement them. So we're really keen here, one of some of the programmes that we run, to actually help support the development of new products and services, uh, which is what we did with this. So I can't remember what the next... Oh, I've got my thing, sorry. I can't remember what the next slide is. So that's basically what I said. Um, we... Uh, supported the development of five new products and services, and I'll kind of quickly run through them. Um, the one in the corner here is a product called Ode, and Ode is a scent release device. And the idea behind this is a um, lot of people, especially with dementia, end up in hospital because they're mal malnourished and dehydrated. And the big issue with that is people forget to eat. Um, they as people age anyway, their appetite wanes, they're not as interested in eating and drinking, but that's one of the biggest issues. When you look at the, the reason people end up in hospital, it might be that they have a broken hip, you know, they've fallen over. But when you look at the cause of that, why did they end up falling over? Well, actually, they've not been eating very well. Um, they've been quite frail because of it. Uh, how can you support people? Um, for us, a lot of this isn't about crisis management. It's about uh, preventative things. So Ode is a product that hopefully is going to market very soon. Um, and it has specially designed fragrances, and you decide what you want. So you have three fragrances that are released at certain times during the day, and it might be a fresh orange juice in the morning, it might be um, a bolognese at lunchtime, it might be um, Bakewell tart in the evening, various different things, and you set it so that it, it starts to release the fragrance about half an hour before you plan to eat, um, and the idea is that it's just a, something that reminds you. You don't see it necessarily. It's not a big product that's around there, but you know, it's a sensory feeling. So you start to think, oh, I'm, I'm quite thirsty, I'm quite hungry, and you end up eating. Um, so for us, that's a, it's been really interesting to see the development of this because actually, as the product started to become developed, what they found was, whilst it's obviously very important for people with dementia, it reaches a lot of other people. And one of the experts on our advisory board is uh, from the King's Fund, and she was saying the value for this in something like hospitals, for anyone, because hospital food, if anyone's ended up in hospital, you know, it's like aeroplane food. doesn't have a smell. It's not freshly cooked. It's pretty awful a lot of the time. So how do you engage people in, in eating more to make them healthier, get them out the door, basically? It costs you less in the health system. Um, there's a lot of other applications. And what we found for all of these projects, bar one, which is dogs, which I'll come on to in a second, was that actually if you look at the, a specific issue, like dementia, and you solve that issue, you're solving it for a lot of people. And, and it makes me think a lot of what David was saying about you know, how we're marketing to people. Because actually, it's not necessarily about being older. It's having a specific issue. And when we talk about ageing, I've done a variety of work in, in kind of ageing and disability, and disabilities and ageing are, are very similar, very related, because you know, if you're not as mobile, if you can't see as well, all those things, you know, they're specific issues that you're looking at. But ageing is a, you know, kind of a, a large space, or dementia is a large space. Dementia is kind of a, a catch-all term for loads of different illnesses. 
And you know, Alzheimer's is only one of them. So memory loss is only one part of dementia. We don't really talk about what the issues are you're trying to, to actually look after. We look at the kind of the category that we've given it. So I'll move on to the dementia dog because I just mentioned that. This is a programme which is a partnership with uh, Alzheimer's Scotland, Grey School of Art and Dogs for the Disabled. And Dogs for the Disabled uh, obviously off, uh, support dogs uh, for the blind, um, dogs for people with autism, a variety of things. And they were very interested in, well, we know that dogs can offer support. How could they help someone with dementia? What are the issues? What are the problems that come along? And a lot of it is about how do you help someone maintain a routine? So, you know, how do you help someone remember to eat, go to the toilet, take their medication, a variety of different things that dogs can be trained to kind of fetch anything, to bring you anything, to prompt you to do anything. They're quite basic things. They can also help you navigate. navigate sorry. And also the basic one is this form of anchoring and support and emotional support. So working, for them, working with carers who would say it's, it's so hard. Obviously, a, a big problem for, for people is... Um, if they're looking after someone with dementia is ending up putting them into a care environment because they just can't cope anymore. And how do you know that someone's going to be okay? If they have a dog, it kind of anchors them. If you take someone out and um, you, say, you leave them in a cafe because you need to go pop and get their, you know, go to Boots to get, to get their prescription or something, you don't know for sure that they're going to stay there for 10 minutes because they might get disorient disorientated, they might start getting really worried and walk off and you don't know what's going to happen. But a dog actually offers kind of an emotional reminder. And it's building those relationships that continue for a little bit longer, that help someone remember what's going on a bit more, just in that confidence. And all those things about confidence came up quite a lot. What are the issues that people need? Um, I'll talk a little bit next about Grupal. Um, and Matthew can obviously tell you more about Grupal uh, afterwards. Um, but that comes back to... One of the things we found a lot with this, which is actually, who are you providing the support for? The person who, you're, who you needs looking after or the person looking after the person? Um, and Grupal is very much about supporting the primary carer and the carers around, those people around them. And how do you build uh, a support network out of the people around them just by using basic technologies that we already know, we already use in a lot of ways? Um, in a, a timeline that can help you see visually when no one's going to see someone. So there's six days in between these things. So you could go and support someone in that, in that time. You know that maybe your dad is going to see someone on a Thursday, see your grandma on a Thursday, but no one's going until the next Thursday. So you can know to go and see that. And one of the things that when we've shown this to people before is they've gone, well, don't families talk to each other? And actually, when it comes to things like this, they don't. Even if you have a close relationship with your family, you often don't talk about these types of things and you don't talk about care. And one of the things that I found when I've talked about all of this is that when we talk about older people, we talk about it as care. When we talk about children, it's just family. You don't call it a care service in that way. Public sector does, but individuals don't. But individuals still talk about it as care for older people. And so you know, when it comes to it, they don't discuss a lot of the things. So how can you create simple support structures that help people and also create those both reminders, support for individuals, um, and at the very basic thing, one of the things that we were quite surprised at when you started developing was um, how little there is actually out there. If, if you end up going into hospital, what's the information sheet that someone might have about you? If, even if you, there's nothing wrong with you, you just don't speak English, it's not your first language, how does anyone know anything about you? How does anyone know what you might be allergic to, what your likes and dislikes are, anything like that? And for people with dementia, you get agitated and worried quite easily that was a big issue so in hospitals people who aren't most people aren't trained to understand the signs of dementia and it meant that um, if you go into hospital it means that if you go into hospital and you get agitated they'll put you on antipsychotic drugs because it calms you down and it's the easiest thing to do and generally you'll never come off those so you'll end up through those through the hospital and often you'll end up then in a care environment um, not only is that pretty depressing for everyone, it's also in terms of the cost we're looking at, incredibly high for the state, um, and also incredibly then distressing for the family. And the issues that I've actually just been reading various articles, I don't know if anyone saw an article in The Observer that was about quality of life for somebody with dementia on the weekend, but um, you're keeping people alive rather than giving them quality of life. I realise I'm probably talking for a long time again. Um, Very interesting for me. 
I'll skip through the other two quite quickly. Buddy, some people may have come across if you work in the ageing space. Um, Buddy itself is a, a product that's kind of GPS, little clip that helps people um, as, as a different type of telecare. So telecare traditionally is about being inside four walls and it monitors the four walls. And you see a lot of old people have those big red buttons that they wear around the neck. Um, and so Buddy, what they've done is look at how GPS can help monitor an individual rather than the room, the, that environment. And Buddy Band that they've developed is, on the one hand, a simple version, better looking version of the big red button, because who wants to walk around going, no, I'm, I'm kind of need support. And look, whereas this is, you know, like, it's similar looking to all of those kind of plastic uh, type of band, exactly, bracelets that you would get. Uh, but this is your emergency alarm. So just gently squeeze the side, and it's got a 24-7 monitoring system. It's also got all the types of technology that you get in things like a wheeze, so an accelerometer, which is both means if you fall over, rapid detection fall, it can alert somebody. And also it's monitoring. So there's a big part of how do you understand the whole self-monitoring, so understanding when things are changing for you, or letting anyone else see your data to understand when things are changing and what support you might need. And that's a product that um, is going on sale in the UK and the US, I think, at the end of the year. Um, and there's a, there's a variety of other things. I mean, you know, when, when they first started working on it with us, um, we saw that there was something that came out um, by Yves Behar. Um, I forgot what it's called now. Which doesn't, the Up bracelet. Um, if anyone knows Jawbone, who do those fancy kind of head... Um, earphones and things, they created a bracelet called Up and it did a lot of these things. It wasn't marketed at this area at all. It was the younger consumer who might want to be looking at their own data. They got millions of pounds of investment in that and it all went very wrong very quickly. The yeah, they withdrew the product in about six weeks because of all the problems with it. Then Nike Fuel Band came out whilst they were developing this as well and Nike Fuel Band actually does a lot more stuff. It's brilliant but it's not targeted to this market at all. And so as a first example of how it could work in this market, Buddy is really strong, but they don't have any competitors, which is quite crazy when you think of how many things are starting to come out in that market and how really what we wanted to try to see in this program was how you could get people to, you know, in, in, in that speak, kind of pivot their product. To say, okay, well, how does it work for a, another audience? Because really the technology that's out there can work for different consumer and again as David was saying it's about where you put it where's the shop front for some of this stuff I think people are learning there that the founder was Sarah Buddy who found confused founders yes that's true so she actually had a situation in a supermarket where she effectively mislaid her daughter mislaid is a nice way of saying it of course David Cameron did it as well didn't he but um, she basically was told by the security guard that she could go out and check everybody's um, car boots because the chances were that the child might be in a car boot somewhere which wasn't very good so she actually got to grips with devising the yeah. yeah. so it was born out of a creative you know thinking person who actually said this could actually have a, an application in so many ways and it's so much more you know, usual, isn't it, to wear that kind of, yeah. you know, bracelet. I think it's a great idea. It's interesting, actually, because that was their, f their first market was, you know, the kind of kids. Yeah. They realised quite quickly that this was a much better market for them. Although the other side of it is that they're, the other thing that they do with the same technology is offender tags mm -hmm. for criminal. For when you leave prison, there's a whole, um, the um, government contract, the £2 billion government contract for that that's just coming up is looking at what technologies they could use and they're kind of in the running for that with a slightly different look, um, <laughs> slightly more secure. <laughs> um, but again, that causes a lot of problems for them as a company because you can't be having those two products under one roof because older people don't want to be tagged, don't want to feel that you're being watched. And one of the things that, they, that, that they've been working on is um, what's the experience for the person who owns the product? How do you feel that you can set the information that's out there? Because and, you know, it's there, it's online, you can have your own page where you can be watched wherever you are, it's GPS. But what's that mean for the person who's the carer, the person who's wearing it, all those other things? And very, very quickly, the last one, which is slightly different, which is around how do you support carers in all of this as well? Um, 
So Trading Times is about creating part-time piecemeal work for carers because the big, a really big problem for people is um, if you're ending up as a carer, there's only so much time you can take out of work before you, you end up having to leave work. Um, and then, you know, it's what they call the squeezed middle. A lot of the time, people who are looking after parents and children um, and may well need to go back to work both for financial reasons and um, to be more engaged with everything that's going on um, and want to. And so how do you support people to find skills-based work in their area? So that's about partnership of local communities, uh, both employers and potential employees. And so we've been working with them. They are continuing to develop. We're continuing to work in different kind of dementia and ageing space, and we've got another whole load of ageing work, but there's a couple of brochures of what we've actually developed on the side, if you want to know more. Okay. Okay. Sorry. Okay. But just make, I have a quick question. So we've got startups in the audience who are watching this. Um, it sounds like you've been able to be a great resource for some sort of early stage company. You know, is that the lot? Is there opportunities in the future for other startups to work with you? Yeah, so um, in challenges, I probably should have explained that a bit better. Um, in challenges, we uh, partner with a client who has a specific area of interest. Uh, issue and we look at how you reframe the challenge that they call it into an opportunity it's something that was mentioned earlier you know what are the opportunities in the in the marketplace um, and then we run these competitions where we offer funding and support for a variety of, of companies at the moment we're also running programs on both um, public health and um, <coughs> the issue of helping younger people into employment and the term that's lovingly called here NEAT, not in employment, education or training, but how do you support people in different forms of, of work? But yeah, we, we run a variety of different programmes like it. So especially in this space, which is something that we continue to work in, ageing and dementia is something that we feel quite importantly to help grow the market is something that's needed. So yeah, they can talk to us. <laughs>